Hi everyone, I'm Stephen Downs. Welcome once again to Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care. We are in Module 7, titled The Decisions We Make. Now the overall purpose of this module is to look at the learning analytics and AI workflow from beginning to end and consider it as a whole thinking about at each point the decisions we make as we go through it and therefore what the ethical implications might be. It's an attempt to get past a fairly simplistic look at learning analytics that focuses in on a particular thing like say data bias or a particular part of the analytics process such as course completion. Now we're looking at this much more broadly and so it's useful to take a, a beginning to end look at this. So that's the objective for today. Um, the uh, learning analytics and AI uh, does not operate in a vacuum. In a vacuum, <laughs> does not operate in a vacuum. Uh, I'm going to quote quite a bit in this talk from. Uh, uh, Dragon, Shane, and George's paper uh, on learning analytics titled something like, remember, learning analytics is about learning. And they write, learning analytics needs to build on and better connect with the existing body of research knowledge about learning and teaching. Some of the key questions that we need to ask as we look at learning analytics, uh, what are we trying to do? Uh, what are our objectives? What are we trying to measure or predict? Who is involved? And a range of other questions setting, in other words, the overall learning analytics context. There is not, and probably won't be for years, maybe decades, a general artificial intelligence or a general AI. So all applications of analytics and AI are built specifically for a, a particular context. And when they're built for a particular context, how you define that context immediately shapes how you will define that application of AI and analytics. Uh, here we have a model, uh, a framework basically provided by uh, Greller and Drashler, uh, a pedagogical model that contains basically six dimensions, competence, constraints, method, objectives, data, and stakeholders. Now, I've taken competences out of that, and uh, the place maybe to look at that might be in the uh, final module, and I'm deferring a look at data to the next video. So what we're going to be looking at in this video will be basically theory, objectives, stakeholders, and constraints. Though not in that order. Because why would I follow the order I've just put on the slide here? Uh, so let's begin then with stakeholders. When we think of stakeholders, we can perhaps begin with the concept of responsibility for artificial intelligence, responsibility for analytics. And basically here, what we're looking at is the concept of complicity. That is, anybody who's involved in some way or another, in other words, anyone who is complicit, is responsible for the outcomes of an AI analytics system. Now, that might seem like a non-controversial statement, but it isn't. Um, it isn't for two reasons. First of all, uh, there are some people that suggest that analytics and AI might become autonomous and therefore become self-responsible for their own actions. Now, I'm rejecting that here in this discussion Although I don't want to presume to have closed the door on the long-term debate about this issue. However, I think that for the foreseeable future, responsibility for AI 
will still be attached to people who are complicit in its development and deployment, not uh, assigned exclusively to the AI on the basis that the AI is autonomous. I just don't think people will accept that. The second argument uh, that pushes against this is the idea that some people, but not all people, are responsible for the outcome. Uh, for example, uh, if somebody designs and builds a vehicle and then the vehicle gets into an accident, they might argue that, well, it's the person who's driving the car who is responsible for the outcome, not the person who built the car. And a similar case might be made with respect to AI. Uh, if you don't like the car example, an example where this principle actually holds is with, the, uh, with respect to weapons, um, the manufacture of guns. If somebody shoots another person with a gun, under current law, the person or companies that manufactured the gun are not held liable for the outcome of the use of that gun. So we have two different views here on how to assign responsibility for AI. And here I'm taking the perspective that complicity, complicity means that the responsibility, and here I'm quoting from Zimmerman, is shared by individuals involved in its development and deployment regardless of their particular intentions. Now, um, it might be argued that uh, you know nobody could predict the outcomes of the AI. However, uh, you know, yes, AI is inscrutable. Yes, AI is difficult to predict because we don't have simple rules that we can appeal to and determine the outcome of. But nonetheless, uh, it's up to system creators and operators, to quote uh, Joshua Kroll here, to determine that the technologies they deploy are fit for certain uses. So even though elements of the system are inscrutable, the overall application of the, of the uh, system is not inscrutable. So why do I take such a wide perspective? Well, mostly for completeness. Um, I could take a narrower perspective and maybe even defend that. Uh, but for the purposes of talking as broadly as possible about the ethics of AI, such an approach would be self-defeating. So I want to consider at least the possibility that everybody involved in AI will be responsible for AI and, that, and in that way get at all of the different decision points that are going to be made uh, with respect to the development and deployment of AI so that we can understand what the ethics of each of those will be. Uh, now, just to be clear, I'm not going to look at the ethics of each and every single point of decision, but I'm going to try to identify them and, I, uh, and outline in broad strokes the ethical implications. Um, sometimes responsible for an AI is rolled up into a single person uh, that might be called the chief AI officer. This does not absolve other people of responsibility. Uh, you know, just as uh, a command structure does not absolve employees or, or uh, members of the military or whatever to be responsible for their own actions. But the usefulness of this uh, job description and this rolling up of responsibilities is that it touches on some of the major areas somebody responsible for AI at an executive level might be responsible for. For example, the AI roadmap, AI business models, project implementation processes and project management, uh, specific technologies and machine learning algorithms that are used, governance and ethics, people hiring data scientists, we're going to come back to that, AI platform architecture and design, pipeline automation. Just because it's automated doesn't mean you're absolved of responsibility for what happens during that automation. Infrastructure and deployment. All of these are areas uh, 
of responsibility where ongoing day-to-day -day decisions need to be made. If you think about that, uh, think about all of the ethical issues that we've talked about, all of the ethical approaches that we've talked about, including most recently ethics of care and similar sorts of theories, these all mesh with all of these different responsibilities. So where each of those ethical considerations comes up, each one creates an interaction with each one of these decision points. And that's why I'm not gonna go through them all. I'm already talking about uh, 10 separate sets of ethical decisions that need to be made. That's why it's so hard to come up with just you know, a single, here's our ethical theory for AI. Well, how does that ethical theory apply to the roadmap? How does it apply to pipeline automation, etc.? cetera? Um, looking at the stakeholders uh, in AI is uh, Mohammed Kali and Martin Ebner, who in uh, 2015 uh, created this map of stakeholders. And this is more specifically applied to the learning analytics context. And they identify four major groups of stakeholders by their role in the system, specifically learners, instructors, researchers, and educational institutions. I think it is relevant to identify those four layers because their objectives and the roles that they play in the design of AI and analytics are gonna be very different. Uh, for example, learners want to, say, enhance their performance or get course recommendations. Instructors want to improve teaching and maybe provide feedback to students. Researchers evaluate courses, develop course models, develop new instructional technology. And institutions have their, own, their whole set of goals, their business models, their institutional criteria for development and growth um, and learning outcomes. So we can see here that looking at those people who are involved in AI, each set of stakeholders is going to bring into the picture a different set of objectives. Now that's an important consideration. Um, data, uh, Different um, stakeholder groups can also be defined with relation to their relation to, or with respect to their relation to uh, the data collection process. For example, uh, Suford and others wrote uh, about data subjects as being a, a group of learners and data clients as being teachers, tutors, discussion moderators, etc. So you have the research group on the one hand that you're studying, and then the client looking at the outcome of the analytics who are going to use those results in order to presumably improve education. GDPR breaks this into three groups. That's the general, per, uh, general data protection regulation uh, from Europe. It identifies data subjects those are the people GDPR was written to protect and, and, and are usually the group of uh, learners. In other words, the same sort of data subjects as in the previous distinction. Data controllers, those who actually make the decisions about personal data pro processing. And then finally, data processors who may have been outsourced by the data controllers. So, for example, an educational institution might have uh, an analyst who's making decisions about uh, data collection and analysis, but they may have hired a company to, the act, to do the actual collection and storage and run the algorithms. Um, again, these are all subject to their own distinct responsibilities for the outcome of AI and analytics processes. Uh, why is this important? Well, if we prioritize one group of stakeholders over another, we might get bad results. For example, if we prioritize institutional stakeholders, then we might get a situation uh, that Zeed wrote about where 
and I quote, the president of Mount St. Mary's University administered a predictive analytics test to see which students were most uh, at risk of failing. The idea was to encourage them to drop out before the university was required to report its enrollment numbers to the federal government, thereby creating better retention numbers and improving its rankings. Now, I hope we can see why that would be bad. Um, although, you know, we've looked at a, a variety of, uh, of ethical theories, there may be some theories according to which that's not bad, maybe a Machiavellian sort of theory. But nonetheless, I think in, in the broader context, and certainly in the context of this discussion, we could say that focusing on the institutional stakeholder would lead to results that are not based uh, on the interests of either educators or especially uh, the data subjects, which is to say the learners in question. And here we have a case where by participating in the predictive analytics, the learners could be harming themselves because they would be encouraged to drop out, which is an undesirable result. So here we have a, a clear case where identifying the stakeholders and making sure that they're all uh, involved in the decision-making process has direct ethical implications. And that's generally what's encouraged uh, something like uh, uh, a requirement or a mechanism for designers and users of AI systems to consult relevant stakeholder groups. That's what Fjeld says anyways. Um, this definition of stakeholders might be tool specific or it might be a wider general policy. It might include policymakers, customers, suppliers, shareholders, if it's a private institution, funders, etc. And of course, include owners, managers, employees, um, and of course, students. There's a process uh, for stakeholder involvement. In fact, you know, there are many descriptions of processes for stakeholder involvement. Uh, I've put up a simple one here, planning process, presentation, promise. Um, but again, how you go about doing stakeholder consultation, who you think is a stakeholder, how much you weigh their interests, how you go through the process of doing the actual stakeholder uh, consultation, and then how you who weight the results and prioritize or don't prioritize specific individual concerns, these are all ethical decisions. Um, in one case, and, and in one case, we may focus on the consequences, however those are defined. Um, in another case, and, and this is the view that I think is more currently in vogue, at least in some quarters, we would focus first on the, the most vulnerable stakeholders um, and look for their expressed needs. That's what a theory of care would tell us. Um, or we might follow general principles of stakeholder consultation and let the chips fall where they may. In each case, the different ethical considerations uh, cash out quite differently. And so deciding on a mechanism for a stakeholder collaboration process is an ethical decision has, and has a direct bearing on the outcome of learning analytics and the ethics of learning analytics. Uh, there are also levels of analysis. And this is a different way, again, of classifying the uh, different stakeholder groups. And I'm sorry about this slide. That should say shum and not shim. Sorry, Simon. Um, and I thought I had corrected that and I thought I had removed that S. So obviously a little lack of perfection in my presentation here. But you know, there are stakeholders at all of these levels, right? Uh, you know, especially for public institutions, you're gonna have uh, regional, state level, provincial level, national, international uh, interest groups. Uh, international, you say, well, not just the United Nations, although they may be interested, but also international research uh, societies, the international scientific community, etc. Meso is the institution-wide uh, level of stakeholder involvement and includes 
administrators, it includes teachers, it includes support staff, uh, including computer science uh, staff, and so on. And then, of course, micro is the individual user, the teacher, the student, uh, the tutor, any others that might be directly involved in specific educational practices. All of these are different ways of defining the stakeholder uh, analysis. Um, here's another way of grouping stakeholders. Uh, this is LUST uh, for groups of users. And it, this is important because it shows that we can't even consider a natural group of stakeholders like students to be a single undifferentiated whole. There are different kinds of stakeholders even within the student community. So uh, LUST, uh, Lust and, and, and colleagues looks at, for example, the no use low level adopters of tools or the intensive active learners who use everything and, and all the everything suggested by the course design and actively use them. Selective users who just pick out certain tools to use and then intensive superficial users who use all the tools uh, but spend more time reading than other groups, uh, predominantly on cognitively passive activities. I kind of garbled that quote, but you get the idea there. In this course, and indeed in all of the MOOCs that I've taught, I've seen examples of all four of those. And we have people in this course, I know because they've contacted me, who are intensive superficial users. They're reading everything but they're not participating in the discussions. Some people are just using some of the tools, but not everything. Some people are doing everything. Um, and some people are just passively, they get the newsletter, that's about it. Each of those is a different group of stakeholders. Each of those is going to have a different perspective regarding uh, what this course is about and how the ethics of learning analytics applies to them. Now, as I've stated before, I'm not doing any measurements. I'm not doing any gathering of information. And it could quite legitimately be asked whether I am serving the best interests of all four of those groups of students by taking this approach. I'm serving my own particular ethical objective but maybe I'm not considering the wider group of stakeholders sufficiently. Certainly that's been suggested to me in the past. Um, stakeholder formation also is subject to ethical considerations. So it's not simply that stakeholders define what the ethics are. At the same time, ethics define what the stakeholders are. And a good example of that is learning design teams. Uh, a learning design team in an AI or analytic supported course is going to involve an AI team. Now, one of the problems that's been observed with AI, we've touched on this in the past, is where everybody involved in the development and deployment of the AI comes from a specific demographic, uh, specifically tech bros. Um, this is argued to be a bad thing, and, and I think for, for good reasons. Uh, certainly it does not respect the consideration of diversity, which we've touched on in previous discussions. So, uh, you know, Fjord says, um, ethical and rights respecting AI requires more diverse participation in the development process. Um, and the first and most common interpretation of this calls for diverse AI design teams. And extending that, we could say it also calls for diverse learning design teams. So uh, we see the interactions that happen between members of a learning design team. I've just borrowed uh, a diagram from Kathy Moore here to show how different people with different objectives and different information will interact with each other. And the idea here is that this be kept diverse. So 
the requirement of diversity is having a direct impact on who becomes members of our design teams. Then the constitution of our design team feeds back into the ethics of the course. So it's not, you know, do this first, then do that. It's a back and forth constant negotiation between the ethics and the people. Who's involved? Why should they be involved? Is it ethical to consider their uh, specific needs? Um, are we considering everybody in an ethical fashion? Okay, that's the stakeholders. That's plenty of questions right there. Plenty of ethical decisions to make. Now we look at the objectives. And here I'm thinking not of the course objectives or the learning objectives. Here I'm thinking of the objectives of the analytical or AI process that were involved. What are we trying to do with our learning analytics? So we, we could look at a bunch of things. Here's a slide where I've actually named Simon Buckingham Shum properly. There you go. Um, although I, I had to uh, paste an image of the slide because SlideShare, as I always predicted, has clamped down on downloads and now you can't download without signing up for a two month trial membership. So boo hiss on SlideShare. But anyhow, uh, some broad objectives might be um, to increase efficiency to ensure our education systems produce the greatest return on investment possible. Or to improve system performance, for example, system-wide management and evaluation decisions. Or perhaps increase transparency so that people can see uh, how the system works, what's working in it, and what isn't. Or to improve student achievement, um, you know, to inform everybody involved in the process so that they can make the best decisions to help each student's achievement. Uh, now a lot of the times we, we look at learning analytics and AI, we just think about, well, you know, how does this correspond to test scores? But as you can see, uh, analytics will serve a much wider range of overall objectives than just that. It's not just course recommenders, folks. Uh, how do we set these objectives? Well, there's a model out there called SMART. And I'm not sure I totally 100% agree with it. But the idea here is that there are ways to design the process you use in order to set up the objectives for your learning analytics or AI process. SMART is an acronym. It stands for Specific, Measurable, actionable, relevant, and time bound. So, and basically the idea is that if you're setting goals, uh, if you're setting objectives, then you need to be able to say clearly what they are, obviously, but also, and really importantly, to know whether or not they have been achieved. If you think about it, that makes sense, right? Uh, if you just say, you know, make learning better, that's what you want to do with learning analytics. Well, that's not specific enough. Uh, making learning better could be any of a number of different things. And it's not measurable enough. How do you know you've made something better? What specific things are you looking at? Out there in the business world, they talk about KPIs or key performance indicators. That might actually be getting, you know, perhaps too analytical for our purposes, but in a lot of actual practical applications of analytics, people will be talking in terms of KPIs and they'll be talking about specific indicators of specific performance that add up to uh, a way of describing these objectives and determining whether or not we've met these objectives. In any environment where uh, there's a lot of management happening. So any environment that involves public money or shareholder money, uh, for example, there's going to be quite a bit of emphasis on being able to determine uh, what objectives have been set and whether they have been achieved. 
So you can see now some of the ethical implications of the objective setting process. Should it all be based on financial objectives? Uh, if not, what are the other objectives that we can be looking at? Uh, how do you quantify or even should you quantify these objectives? Or maybe they're uh, objectives of the type, I know them when I see them. Each of these kind of decisions that we make is going to have an ethical impact. And again, you know, it comes back to it's really hard to see how a simple rule or even a simple process is going to lead you to being able to de determine what the right answer is in each one of these cases. Objectives are measured by metrics. So uh, a key performance indicator is typically a type of metric. There are numerous metrics that learning analytics can draw from. Some of these are relevant, some of them are not. Um, this is a set of metrics for corporate training. Um, and, and these metrics are a bit different perhaps than we might see in a public institution or in uh, the town school, public school or something like that. But they all come up in one way or another. The training cost per person, the amount of learning engagement, the satisfaction with the training uh, experience, course completion, uh, enrollment data, etc. All of these are things that could be measured. And what has to happen is that an analytic process needs to have some comprehension of how these metrics map to the performance indicators and how the performance indicators map to the objectives. This is called a logic model. And the logic model tells you how you get from measurements of data to statements about you know, whether an objective has been met or not. All of this is happening before we've done any of the learning analytics. The idea here is we're getting in our head some idea of what the analytics and AI process needs to accomplish. Uh, perhaps it might be able to be applied to some steps in the logic model. Perhaps, if it's a really good analytics or AI solution, it can handle the whole logic model for you and you don't need to do it, but then you have the problem of figuring out how it's drawing the conclusions it's drawing. Uh, I want to point to one metric, which is course completion, because that one's been talked about a lot over the years. Um, it, it originally came up in the big uh, University of Pennsylvania study that came out, uh, I don't know, it was around 2012, 2013, somewhere around there, uh, where the reports on course completion rates for MOOCs were terrible. And so everybody started going, oh no, MOOCs are awful. Um, course completion has been used, arguably, as a proxy for learning. Uh, what's happened in a lot of media and, and I'm speaking more here of the popular media, not so much researchers, is that um, they come up with a course completion number and they use that as all of the metric and all of the KPI and as the only objective of the course. And so we could talk about the success or failure of a MOOC specifically and only in terms of course completion. Now, based on what I've just said, that should be obviously not a very good idea because there are so many other things to take into account. If we go back to institutional objectives, for example, a lot of institutions have used MOOCs as marketing tools, as publicity tools, as ways to help students get a sense of what it's like to study at a university level. None of these require course completion in order to be successful. And they would certainly meet the university's objective, even if the course completion rate was very low. On the other hand, if your objective is to have people uh, go through a course, well then, yeah, that's that's your, uh, your metric. Uh, where should the objective start. Uh, yeah, we, we talked about consulting the stakeholders and all of that. 
But arguably, even beyond that, uh, there's a case to be made for starting with the public good generally. And if you look, look at the lower right hand side of the slide, I've put in the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And there's a good argument to be made here that overall, there is a social objective that should be fulfilled by educational processes, including learning analytics, such that the outcomes of the deployment of technology in education serve in some way or another to support those 17 goals. Now that's going to bring into ethical consideration things like uh, environmental sustainability, um, for example, and, and uh, education, of course, health care, etc., the, the full range of goals. I'm trying to read it there, but the text is too small for me to read. Maybe if I make it bigger on your screen, at least. Uh, I can't make it bigger on my screen without messing it up. Um, but you can see how, you know, some things that almost seem unrelated to education can play a role in the ethical evaluation of online courses. So... How does this play out in determining objectives? Uh, well, Drew writes, design usually starts with a discovery period of qualitative research into people's lived experiences. So in other words, how is education actually going to affect people? How is the, the learning solution, the learning institution, how are they actually impacting people in the community? Even Alex Usher in a column today uh, said, you know, he, he wrote about the, uh, the mutual growth and interaction between the American university system and the German university system and made it very clear that historically there has always been a back and forth between universities and society such that universities are thought of as providing for the public good in return for which the public provides them with funding, autonomy, etc., so any educational attribution, any educational intervention may play a role in public good. Similarly, data projects or analytics process specifically can often, should often aim for the social good. But Drew points out that's often not what happens. Often the process just starts with the data and they have some data and they sort of go, well, what can we do with this? And as he says, at worst, the process might simply involve playing with a data set for the sake of playing with a data set. Um, or at best, the process might be motivated by a clear public benefit. Knowing what you're working toward is an important part of knowing what you want to do with data and with AI and learning analytics. Now, I shouldn't have to say this, but I want to be complete in this course and this is part of being complete. That takes us to theory. Now here I'm talking about mostly about educational theory. And the thinking here is that what you think about the nature of teaching and learning has a lot of impact on how you approach artificial intelligence and analytics. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover all of educational theory in this presentation. I'm barely going to touch on it, but I hope to say enough to convince you that there is an interplay between theory and AI, and therefore, since there is an interplay, there are decisions to be made, and these decisions will have ethical implications. So, um, right off the bat, uh, let's let's go back to Dragon, Shane, and George, and their talk on or their paper on learning analytics, um, and looking at pedagogical theory. And they note that a lot of learning analytics is aimed at teaching to uh, teaching for memory. Right? Did the person remember the subject? Um, you know. Uh, 
Did they remember specific pieces of information? If so, then the intervention was positive. If not, then the intervention was negative. And by analogy, they argue that this is like teaching to the test rather than teaching to improve understanding. And they say, and I quote, learning analytics that do not promote effective learning and teaching are susceptible to the use of trivial measures such as increased number of logins into an LMS. Or as Wilson says, and I'm paraphrasing here, many things are counted, but few have any bearing on theory or practice. So there needs to be a relation between what you're measuring and what your learning objectives are, whatever those may happen to be. So this is kind of like the logic model discussion we just had, but it's a little more specific. Now we're narrowing down on the specific objective of learning, um, learning outcomes, etc. And in this case, the logic model is at least in some degree replaced by the educational theory in question. So take a, take a typical theory. The socio-constructivist perspective, right? So that is going to give us a model. And here it is on the left-hand side. So we have something called uh, inactive learning and observational learning. Uh, observational learning proceeds by reinforcement, either vicarious, direct, or self. And there's modeling and vicarious learning. That's a crappy explanation of social cognitive theory. Sorry I said it that way, but it's true. Nonetheless, what this is telling us here is, well, we would hope is, what we're looking for, what we're trying to achieve, and to some degree, what things we'll be looking for in the data as indications as to whether or not we've achieved that. So according to a socio-constructivist perspective, a couple of things, active participants in a discussion show better learning outcomes. So Social network of analyses of students discussing in a forum are conducted in order to discover effective ways of supporting participatory online learning. Or to rephrase that, um, we want, you know, we think better learning happens when students have discussions and are actually engaged and involved in the discussions. So what we want our learning analytics to do is find ways that help, that, that help us understand what makes them participate more actively in discussions. But you see the role of the theory here, right? There's no point measuring or evaluating their participation in discussions if it's completely incidental to their learning. On an instructivist theory, for example, uh, the discussions are peripheral. Um, in fact, they add to cognitive load and they actually interfere with teaching. So we're not interested in promoting them. And so we wouldn't measure for things that promote them. But if we accept socio-constructivist perspectives, the discussions are an important component that leads to better learning. So we want to be looking at them. So the selection of theory matters in this case. Now, does the selection of theory have an ethical impact? Well, it might, right? Um, for example, if you choose the wrong theory, and if as a result, the learning that you're offering does not provide the sort of learning benefit that your students desire, then you're wasting their time and their money. And that is arguably ethically bad, either from a consequentialist position or perhaps from an ethics of care position. Um, on the other hand, you might be wasting your time and money by engaging them in discussions, which they could easily do on their own outside school instead of providing them with direct instruction. You need to have these conversations. We need to have these conversations in order to understand the ethical impact of learning theory. Uh, just as an aside, I can't, you know, I've been involved in this 
field for a long time, and maybe I'm just looking in the wrong places. But I can't think offhand of discussions involving the ethics of choosing one theory uh, over another, except for behaviorism. Everybody thinks behaviorism is morally evil. But I mean, besides that, right, uh, choosing between, say, constructivism and connectivism, is there an ethical impact to that? Uh, maybe there is. Uh, we, we'd have to think about that. Um, so the sort of theory that I just described is based on a theory about how we construct knowledge, the, the different processes that are involved. And again, this assumes a, a constructivist approach. But here we have, and I'll quote from the same authors again, uh, the, a model that builds on conditions, operations, products, evaluation, and standards learners adopt in order to explain how they construct knowledge. So, in essence, learners construct knowledge by using tools to perform operations on raw information in order to create products of learning. Well, that's something that we can analyze and assess, right? So, we're looking for these five elements of a COPE's model, and here we find them in this diagram. So, we can look at, say, for example, task conditions, including resources, instructional cues, time, social context, all of these might define data points, and then these lines represent uh, either interactions, associations, cause, or influence on other data points. I think these arrows are theoretical and are the sorts of things that would need to be empirically observed or defined, um, but it might also be that these arrows represent connections that we would hope to form in a viable AI system. And again, your perspective is going to shape what you think counts as success on one of these models. So here's another way of looking at something similar. Um, so it's WINS axioms for uh, self-regulated learning. Now I'm, I'm calling them WINS axioms but I'm not sure that that uh, title is used widely, if at all, in the field, but it certainly seems like it. Uh, the axioms are pretty simple. Uh, learners construct knowledge. Learners are agents. That's important because they're going to do things you don't expect. Um, and then data as well includes randomness, and there are differences in instructional conditions, internal conditions, and external conditions. Now, Part of the problem, to my mind, with a model like this is, it's hard to see how you get from this to an effective uh, design of an AI or analytics project. Um, you know, I look at, okay, I, I see concentric circles, right? So we're, we're based on student regulated learning uh, surrounding that are teacher's belief, surrounding that are the pedagogical processes, which is a wheel of activities. And then around that is the enactment in classrooms. Around that are the resources, curriculum, and school culture that you might find. And then the exosystem uh, of community, society, and culture. Okay. So... These might suggest things that we could measure uh, or detect as data, but society, culture, community, and home, these are really broad data points. Right? We, we, we can't use those to design an analytics engine. Uh, the sorts of things we look at closer to the center of the circle, perhaps the pedagogical processes level here is the most definitive of these levels where we're looking at things like recreational support, instrumental strategic support, etc., And there may be indicators of those, but again, we'd need to draw some kind of model connecting the specific indicators with these general terms. And so, you know, the model that you choose is going to help you 
but only to a certain degree with respect to the learning analytics that you undertake. And in most circumstances, I think, when an analytics or AI project is developed, to a large degree, they may start with one of these models, but the people actually designing the technology are building in large elements of the model as they develop the AI. Just as an aside, I have found that happening in my own practice and not even doing AI or analytics, but as I write technology for my MOOCs, including this MOOC, I find I might start from a theory, but each line of code that I write is a specific elaboration on that theory that wasn't considered at the time the theory was written because there wasn't the practical requirement to actually implement it specifically in practice. You know, the more you apply these theories, the more you need to develop, refine, shape, and specify exactly what you're doing, exactly what you want your technology to do or your teachers to do, exactly what the outcome should be. Um, again, in that model, we had the conditions for learning, and these again uh, are mentioned by Geshevik, Dawson, and Siemens. They include the instructional conditions, uh, which include, includes instructions, and sorry, instructors, their models, and the technology choices. External conditions, such as instructional design, social contacts, etc. All of these are data points. All of these interoperate differently depending on your model or theory. And then the internal conditions. Um, so this would be internal to the, uh, the individual, such as achievement, goal, orientation, cognitive load, or epistemic belief. And, and they say, I think, very diplomatically that these are yet to be fully understood in relation with their collection and measurement. Uh, take something like cognitive load, um, it, this is something that, to my mind, is a completely theoretical construction based on uh, a model of cognition that uses computational processes as a metaphor or an analogy. And so, just as a computer has an input buffer, so cognitive, cognitive load theory thinks that a human has an input buffer and therefore a certain size limit to the information they can process. And they use that to justify all kinds of practices that eliminate extraneous cognitive load. Now, I have all kinds of problems with that, but the main problem I have with that is it is not at all clear to me that a thing called cognitive load actually exists. And so, if your pedagogical model includes things like cognitive load or any other of these theoretical terms, these need to be rendered in terms of actual observables. What is it that you are talking about when you talk about cognitive load? Now, I know that it might be a theoretical entity, and I know there can be theoretical entities. Mass for example, as a theoretical entity. We can't get at mass directly. But we know how to measure for mass, and you measure for it using a scale and understanding what the force of gravity is in the environment where you're using the scale. And that allows you to determine mass. Or you can count the molecules in a certain body, and then you know the weight of each mole or the mass of each molecule, and that allows you to work with mass as well. If you don't have something like that for cognitive load, then you can't implement a design or a test for cognitive load in your analytics and AI system. Things to consider, again, from the same authors. Um, when you're working with your pedagogical models, consider uh, 
qualitative research methods versus simple quantification. As they write, the primary emphasis in the learning analytics field has been memory recall. But there's more to learning than memory. Uh, and I've often said learning is not memory. Learning is not remembering. Uh, learning is, in important ways, becoming something. And so what you want to measure is not simply the recall of specific facts, but instead indicators of having become a certain type of person. For example, being able to perform a certain operation or using a word correctly in new contexts, things like that. Secondly, uh, it's important to think about how to design effective visualizations and dashboards. The thing about learning theory is that it's, to a large degree, pretty opaque to most people, and for good reasons. Um, and you want to be able to translate that into something that people can access and use and understand. There's no point building uh, a learning analytics or AI system at all if people can't use it. So this is a very practical consideration, taking that data, taking that theory, combining it, and putting it into a presentation that people can understand. And then third, uh, the development of a learning analytics culture and policy generally. Um, this involves reshaping, to a certain degree, the learning theories that people might already have. If, for example, a certain percentage of your instructional staff thinks of the outcomes of learning as being memory recall, then there's a disconnect between that perception that they have and the application of learning analytics in the institution. And so there needs to be a mechanism involving those people and this project to create a more comprehensive culture so that the different parts of it, even if they're not all working toward a common goal, and many times they won't be, are at least aware of the existence of the other and at least have mechanisms to consider input and communication from the other. Uh, and, you know, and, and a learning analytics culture and learning analytics policy doesn't mean everybody gets on board with the learning analytics train. It means that Learning analytics exists in this environment, and it's one of the things that characterizes this environment, much like walls, ceilings, a power system, plumbing, and the rest. Finally, let's look at some of the constraints. Um, we can divide constraints into external constraints and internal constraints. Internal, er, sorry, external constraints will involve many of the constraints that we've talked about with respect to ethical issues. Now, these emerge as constraints, not as ethical issues specifically, not as matters of ethics specifically, but rather in terms of policy and procedure environments. For example, privacy. Privacy is regulated in many environments regulated in Europe. Uh, when I was in uh, Alberta, there was the Freedom of Information and Personal Privacy, or FOIP. Uh, there are also privacy considerations here in Ontario. Contrast that too with um, access to information protocols, uh, which require the disclosure of information. Uh, that's what we work with here in a government environment. There are other ethical measures as well. Um, you know, the uh, Treasury Board, for example, has come out with ethical guidelines for the use of artificial in education, sorry, artificial intelligence. Your school board or your provincial government may also have guidelines, ethical guidelines on the use of AI. Certainly, there will be more sweeping research ethical guidelines. I sit on a research ethics board, for example. There are specific policies and procedures that we expect research projects in general, including AI and analytics research projects, to undertake, uh, having to do with protecting the subjects, making sure there, is, there isn't harm, making sure there is sufficient scientific merit, 
etc. There are also norms, uh, things you might not think about, for example, uh, intellectual property rights, legal data protections, etc. So a lot of law will come into play when you're working with AI and analytics. And then even the time scale. How quickly are you trying to do something? Uh, are you doing just in time AI in order to provide real time content recommendation for students? That really impacts what you can do. Now, all of these are constraints. All of these are the sorts of things that, although they're not directly related to ethics, will impact what you can do and therefore impact the decisions that you can make in an AI or an analytics context. Uh, in Europe, of course, they have the GDPR and the GDPR has a direct impact on the application of analytics and AI. Here's a rough eight stage summary of GDPR. Uh, and of course, it's a huge regulation. Uh, but uh, things like the right to be informed, the right of access, the right to rectification, the right to object to processing, the right to restrict processing, the right to data portability, the right to be forgotten, and rights in relation to automated decision making and profiling. These are legislative imperatives that need to be followed, which means that some kinds of AI can be performed, some kinds of AI can't be performed. Uh, take something like rectification. Has the analytics project been designed in such a way that the withdrawal of data has an impact on the conclusions that result from the AI? Suppose you're using data to train a model and data has been withdrawn such that uh, the new set of data would train the model slightly differently. So do people see that as an obligation to retrain the model with the new data? Uh, that's important because the model will be used to make predictions. And if the model is, if the model currently in use was trained using data that has now been withdrawn from circulation, the question comes up, should you be using that model? And I think that's a, you know, that's the sort of question that needs to be asked when considering external constraints. Internal constraints uh, have to do with the capacity of the people working with the data analytics to use the data analytics effectively. Uh, there are two areas that are, are drawn out in this paper here. Uh, first of all, uh, with respect to interpretation. Now, I've talked about this before. Um, any set of data, any set of evidence uh, needs to be interpreted. Uh, that is to say, given a significant meaning, purpose, whatever, um, in order to be applied. Simply knowing that 49 people finished the course and 48 people dropped out that raw data needs to be interpreted. For example, is that a significant number of dropouts? Uh, for example, um, were dropouts important in the design of the course? Things like that, right? So you need to know, you need to be able to take the results of the analytics and then relate them back in some way to the work that you're doing or the environment you're working with. And that's interpretation. And if you don't have that skill, it's very hard to use the results of analytics and AI effectively. Secondly, critical thinking. Um, you know, there's the story about people who uh, uncritically use uh, Google Maps as uh, a way to get directions when they're driving and end up driving into the river. Uh, they have uncritically used Google Maps. They did not employ critical thinking. For example, uh, probably driving into the river is a bad idea. That's pretty simple critical thinking. But the same sort of thinking is going to be required 
in understanding and applying AI. If the results of an AI are unreasonable, then you shouldn't do them. Uh, you shouldn't follow them. I have AI in my car. Um, and one of the things I have is adaptive cruise control. It's a beautiful system. I love it. What it does is when I set my car on cruise control, it'll try to keep the speed, but it's also watching the environment in front of me and will set, a, you know, it won't go too close to the thing that's in front of me. Well, I still have to use that critically. Sometimes it stops or slows me down when there's nothing there. It really does. And, and so I need to press on the gas to correct it's slowing me down. Other times, it doesn't slow down even though there is something there. And that's important because if I don't do anything, I'll just crash into the thing. And I can't turn around and say, well, it was the AI failed me. Well, the AI does what the AI does. But it's up to me as a critical user to recognize it failed to detect the car in front of me. Now it's up to me to act. And that's what we mean by critical thinking with respect to AI. Now, I know we haven't talked about any particular uh, aspect of the traditional AI workflow in this. And we'll talk about that beginning with the next module. I'm talking specifically about data, what data is, how it's collected and all of that. But I hope that this presentation has given you a sense of the range of decisions, the types of decisions and the importance of the decisions that people need to make with respect to the specific learning context in the process of applying artificial intelligence and AI. Now, I've put the two most important papers into today's newsletter to accompany this presentation. And I do recommend that you read them. But even if you don't, I hope that this, is, this has convinced you that, you know, at every point, all of these decisions, and how many decisions have I talked about? 100, 200, 1,000? Um, every one of these decisions is going to have an ethical impact. And this is, again, why uh, I have said in the past, and I will continue to say, the environment that we're working in now is far too complex to depend on simple ethical theory and simple ethical approaches. And it really does concern me that most of the discussion about ethics and analytics and AI in learning is focused on things like memory retention, course completion, and bias in the training data. Yeah, they're all important. They're one small part of a much broader picture. And we need to understand this broader picture if we're going to do ethics in learning and analytics correctly. So that's it for this. Uh, I'm Stephen Downs, and I'll be back not too long from now with some discussion about data and the use of data in AI and analytics. Bye for now.